Well, good morning, Branch Church. It's an absolute blessing to be with you again in week two of our new building, God's Amazing Grace to Us. Have you ever left a movie and felt like, that was a nice story and all, but I have some follow-up questions. There's some loose ends that I would really like tied up. If you've ever felt that way, you're not alone. I felt that way about 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> now, if you don't know the story, really quick, there's this evil villain, Cruella de Vil. And she wants to steal Dalmatian puppies to unfortunately make a Dalmatian coat for herself. She ends up stealing about 101 Dalmatians and they're running away. She's chasing them. She gets in a car wreck. She's not able to get them. She's okay after the wreck. She gets up. She yells at Horace and Jasper Baden because they messed up. And then the puppies, they make it their way home. And it's a wonderful homecoming celebration. It's Christmas. It's a beautiful ending. Nice story. Thank you, Disney, for writing it. But you go, you know, I have, I have some questions. What happened to Cruella? Did they, did they tell the police on her? Did they put some kind of security system? Did they move away? I mean, she was a pretty evil lady, and she's not dead. So, so could you, what the story really could use is, a, is an epilogue. An epilogue is something that is written in addition to the story that ties up loose ends. It answers questions it knows the audience has and helps bring it to a more full and satisfying conclusion. So we have really ended the gospel of John last week. John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31. We are given the purpose of the book. All the deeds, all of the miracles and the words of Jesus were written for a reason, for a purpose that you would what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and by believing you would have what? Life, end of story, great gospel. We believe. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go forward. But there's some loose ends that John needs to tie up. What happened to Peter? Peter had a pretty big denial. He goes on to do great work for the Lord, and the early church knows that, but how was that fixed? What happened in between? And then a rumor started to circulate that John was going to be alive when the Lord returned. Well, if John died and the Lord hadn't returned, then people could use that and say, the gospel is a farce. You can't really trust it. So John has added chapter 21 of John as an epilogue to tie up loose ends. And through tying up loose ends, we are gonna learn this, that Jesus lives and continues to shepherd his people after his resurrection. He will show that he truly is alive and that he takes care of his people. And we'll see the numerous ways in which he does this. Turn with me to John chapter 21, beginning in verse one. John 21, beginning in verse one a fun chapter because this isn't one you normally maybe study or know a lot about. So it's like, oh yeah, this is interesting. Chapter 21, verse 1. After this, that is the resurrection appearances of Jesus, it says Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, The sons of Zebedee and two others of the disciples were together. That makes seven. Where are the other five? I don't know. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples, they did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? Children is kind of a, an equivalent here probably for, hey guys, you didn't catch anything, did you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. 
It's now been about two weeks since Jesus first appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. And they are now in Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, as he appears to them. So what's going on here? Are the disciples off track? Have they abandoned the mission of Jesus, gone back home to Galilee, and gone back to their original vocation, their fishing? Hey, to heck with this. We're just going to go do this now. Or are they simply just hungry and they need to get some fish? Well, first, let's go back. What are they doing in Galilee? In Mark chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus told them this before he died and rose from the dead. When I die and rise, I will go before you where? Into Galilee. In Mark 16, 7, after he rose from the dead, the angel told the women, go tell the disciples that he is going to go ahead of you into Galilee. So the reason they're in Galilee probably is because Jesus told them that's where he was going. So I don't think they are necessarily off track, abandoning the mission and just saying, forget all this following Jesus stuff. Some commentators have gone that far. I do not feel that we should go that far. I don't feel that strong. Plus Jesus comes and he doesn't rebuke them for this. Hey guys, what's wrong with you? Get back on track. We don't see any of that. I mean, they might be a little bit off track a a little bit, but you got to fish, you got to eat, right? And so what's the problem here? They fish all night and they catch nothing. Horrible night. Catch nothing. I imagine their tummies are rumbling and they're hungry. This is a big deal because in this day and age, if you don't catch fish, you don't eat. If you don't have food, you don't, if you don't have extra food, you can't barter for other food. You're in big trouble here. So this is a, this is a hard situation for them. There are a series of books called A Week in the Life Of. I was introduced to these recently. I've read one and I've read most of another one. And they do things like a week in the life of Ephesus, a week in the life of Corinth, a week in the life of a Roman centurion, a week in the life of the fall of Jerusalem, a week in the life of a Greco-Roman woman. And I read most of that one. And that one was really interesting. It walks through a woman's life in first century Ephesus and what it would have been like. And for her, it's a historical fiction, but it brings in a lot of true history within the historical fiction. And her, her husband would go out and he would fish every morning. And then he would bring back what they caught. She would go to the marketplace and she would sell it. And if he didn't catch anything, they didn't have anything to eat or anything to sell or anything to barter. So for the disciples to be in the situation, this is a very big deal. Now, what's the solution to their problem? Jesus shows up and he says, throw your net to the right side of the boat. What do you think their attitude might have been? Now, we don't know this, but I wonder. Hey, we've been fishing all night. What are you talking about? We've gone left, right, up, down. We've circled six times. We can't find anything. It doesn't tell us that. So they throw it to the right side, and what happens? They get such a catch that they are struggling. Seven men are struggling to now bring it in to the boat. And you go, weird. How did this guy know this? And so John, looking about 100 yards away, that's Jesus! It's the Lord. And what does Simon Peter do? He jumps into the water. Now, Simon Peter, he's dressed for kind of boys only company here. He could be completely nude or he could be wearing like a Tarzan loincloth. But anyway, he doesn't have his outer garment on and he throws it on, which isn't going to help you swim very well. And he begins to swim 100 yards to Jesus. I've never been a a competitive swimmer, but I don't think that will help very much. And to swim 100 yards, that's a lot of work. To run 100 yards is pretty good, let alone swim. It's like, Peter, couldn't you have stayed in the boat and helped us out? I don't know. He's excited to see the Lord. And I think that's really good news, considering where we left off with Peter before the resurrection. It, It wasn't so great. And so Peter swims, the boat shows up, and they find a charcoal fire. The last time we saw a charcoal fire was in John 18, 18, where Jesus, I'm sorry, where Peter denied Jesus three times. Is there a connection here? Possibly. It's the only other time it's used in the gospel and I think in the entire New Testament. So I don't know for sure, but there's a good chance that possibly there's a connection. Verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them. 
and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they get to shore, and what happens? Jesus commands them, come and have breakfast. So Peter brings over the fish they caught, and we finally find out how much it was, 153. What is the significance of that number? I have no idea. (laughs) But there are so many theories and thoughts on it. For you mathematicians, they were doing the triangular of certain numbers to process that as like, woof, it was a lot of stuff. I think that's a little too much. I think at the very least, the significance is that's a lot. (laughs) I think that's safe. This is a lot. In fact, it's miraculously a lot, especially considering there was nothing there. And now all of a sudden, 150, and the net didn't tear, what seems to be another miracle. And they come, and they eat, and they sit with Jesus. What's happening here in this scene? First of all, Jesus is showing them that he is, in fact, alive. The same Jesus that was alive in Jerusalem is alive 80 miles north in Galilee. It was not a hallucination. They are seeing the Lord as he is, resurrected. It truly is him. He is not playing games with them. He really did die and he really did raise from the dead. This is absolutely incredible that they got to see this again. Another thing we see here is not only did he show them that he's alive, he showed them that he is the one still taking care of them. When they were fishing without Jesus, what did they catch? When they began to fish with him or when Jesus came along and provided for him, what did we see? Such a blessing that seven men struggled to get it into the boat. There's this movie, uh, I'll just tell it to you. It's called Night and Day, spelled K-N-I-G-H-T, night like a medieval night. stars Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz. Tom Cruise plays that typical character where he's the spy, can do everything, can beat everybody up, really smart, always ahead of the game. Cameron Diaz is playing kind of the girl who gets caught between the good and the bad, and he's trying to protect her, and they're in the car, they're driving, and she doesn't know what side he's on. Are you good? Are you bad? What's going on? I want out of the car. So he, he, he's, I've had it. He pulls over, he lets her out, he starts untying the rope, and he says, I want you to know. He's like, without me, your chances of survival are here. With me, here. And he starts to untie the rope more. Without me, with me. Without me, with me. Without me, with me. And he keeps repeating it to her. It's more funny if you see it, but... <laughs> The point is that without Jesus, we're here. With Jesus, the blessing is uncontainable. We can barely take it from one place to the next. We must never forget where the center of the Christian life really is. Abiding in who? Jesus. Jesus. We don't come to Jesus, get saved, check the box, pass, go. We win a trip to heaven. We'll see you later. No, the life we continue to live in him. Paul understood this when he said in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And if Christ lives in me, I cannot be the same person. I will be different. I will be growing. My thoughts will be changing. My attitudes will be different. Sure, I'll have hiccups and I'll have struggles with my flesh here and there. We all do. But to have the Savior living in you, that is a transformative presence because we're talking about the Holy Son of God. And what he dwells in, I believe he will continue to change, transform, provide for, and walk through. What do we see here in the first half of the chapter? Jesus lives and he continues to provide and shepherd his people. Know for yourself, the Lord has not abandoned you as his sheep. He still walks with you, cares for you, lovingly disciplines you, moves you along the way. If he was gracious enough to come down and save you when you weren't even asking for help and he has rescued you from your sin, how much more is he gonna continue to take care and to see you all the way through? I know we know this, but boy, do we need to hear it every day. Now, on to the loose ends. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. They had breakfast. Breakfast is done. And now Jesus asked Peter the same question three times. Do you, lo- do you love me? No, not like that. It's very serious. Do you love me? And the first question, though, is posed just a little bit differently. Do you love me more than these? Who are these? What is these that he's talking about? The idea probably is this. Do you love me more than these disciples? Now, why would Jesus want to know that or ask that question? Well, if you rewind the tape, what did Peter do before Jesus died? John 13, 37, what did he say? I'll lay down my life for you. Mark 14, 28 makes it even more clear. Though everybody else fall away, not me. I would never fall away. Seems to be some pride in that statement. Not me. My love, everybody else's, maybe here, but me. Nope, hit the target every time. Do you love me more than these? How does Peter reply? He's humble. Lord, you know that I love you. He doesn't jump and to be prideful in it. He's asked a second and a third time, and he gives the same response. He modifies it a little bit on the third time, where he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Why does, Peter, why does Jesus ask Peter three times? It probably has something to do with how many times he denied him. He denied him three times, which possibly is this idea of a full, complete denial. Once, maybe you accidentally said it. I didn't mean to say it. I'm so sorry. No, you did it two. You did it three times. And on the third time, you were calling down curses on yourself. This was a complete public denial. And now when Jesus asks him three times, it seems now to be a full, complete reinstatement. Jesus is taking Peter and bringing him back into the fold. And even more, he's going to restore him to a leadership position. This is mind-blowing. Would you have picked Peter after what he did here with such a black mark on his record to serve the Lord? I wouldn't. I don't think I would have picked myself. But the Lord shows his glory in picking those who were broken with black marks on their record who probably should never be in leadership and God transforms them and makes them into his shepherds. And it's incredible what the Lord does. And then, then he says to Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. What does that mean? spiritually take care of my people. Take my truth, my words, and you nourish them. You feed them. You encourage them. You walk with and you be with people with the truth that I have given you. Two things here I think we can learn as leaders. One, we are called to take care of the sheep. We ground their hearts in the gospel and what God has done for them. That's the gospel. I love the way D.A. Carson says it. What God has done for for you. And we continue to encourage them to live in the reality now that is that gospel. Second thing here we learn as leaders is that the sheep do not belong to us. Jesus says, tend my sheep, my lambs. We love those who are in front of us as leaders, but at the end of the day, I do not claim ownership. We do not claim ownership over you. You belong to the Lord. So please don't ever call this Sean's church. Don't call it Chuck's church. I think Chuck would be in agreement. Don't call it so-and-so's. It's the Lord's church. We are merely under shepherds who serve at the pleasure of the great master. And I I don't think most of us mean that when we say it, Sean's church or Chuck or whatever, but it's a good practice for us to get our language to just be refined and even better. This is the Lord's church where so-and-so might pastor or serve. I know as a, she- as a shepherd, and a sheep, as a shepherd, I want to care for you well. I hope to feed you with God's word and you would be encouraged with his glory and on fire for him. I hope to minimize my mistakes. I'm, I apologize if I've ever hurt you or sinned or said something wrong. I'm sure I have and I hate that. I don't want to stand before the Lord and even hear. It's like, Lord, I'm sorry, just I'm sorry. Just let's move on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I messed up. Give me, the, give me the blood of Christ, right? I just, but I do make mistakes. But the Lord is gracious as he was with Peter, even with us as leaders, to continue to encourage us and help us to walk with people. Something else to add here into this 
Oh, no, I, I know what I was going to tell you. I, f- I figured out why I'm so thrilled to teach on Sunday mornings. And the reason I'm so thrilled is I get to declare to you God's glory. There's nothing else I'd rather do with my life. Because here's what I know. God's glory is what changes you. God's glory, his beauty, his majesty, his grace, all the impressiveness that he is, that is what encourages you, transforms you, grounds you, makes you a better you. I love and I'm encouraged when you tell me nice sermon or good job or I was encouraged by this. Absolutely, we are encouraged by that as leaders. Don't ever stop encouraging your leaders or one another. But I know in my heart why you were truly were encouraged because you understood God's glory and whatever was said. You understood the word as God expounded it to you through me or through whomever. That's what's so exciting because I have nothing to offer you. If I were to sit down, Sean, tell me something wise and write a book. I would have nothing to tell you. I have nothing. But we'll get into God's word and help you understand that. Let's go all day. I love that. Now, one more thing we have to point out here about this interaction with Jesus and Peter. There are two different Greek words for love that are used here. Jesus says, do you agapaome? That's a form of agape. You've heard the word agape, Christian love. Do you agapaome? Peter says, I phileo you. He changes the word. Jesus says, do you agapao me? Jesus says, I phileo you. Jesus now the third time changes the word, do you phileo me? Peter says, yes, I phileo you. So is John trying to tell us that Peter had some less form of love for the Lord here? The simple answer is no. The word agapao and phileo, they are interchangeably used in the gospel of John. When we look at how John used it, the father loves the son, agapao and phileo, they're both used. Do we want to parse that and make sh- and say that God only loves him a lot here, but like only brotherly kind of love? No, we wouldn't want to do that. Jesus' love is described for Lazarus. Both words are used. The Father's love for the disciples. Both words are used. John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Agapao phileo. Both words are used. So what's going on here? It's just a stylistic variation that Peter or that John is doing here. He is not trying to say there is some other secret form or less form of love going on here. We have to be careful when we take a Christian word and just blanket statement. Agape means unconditional, divine, godly love all the time. No, it doesn't. 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul says, Demas, in love and agape with the world, deserted me and went to Thessalonica. Did Demas unconditionally, God divine love the world and desert? No. No. The word is not used to mean that. So just a carefulness with how we use words and an extra effort to understand how did the author use it when they meant it. And this is where scholars are so helpful who spend all that time getting in so that way we can be fed from their work. Amen. I know I am thankful for scholars. Or again, I probably have not much to say to you. (laughs) We see the stylistic variation too within this. He says, tend, feed, sheep, lambs. Do we want to parse that out and say some of you are lambs and some of you are sheep? (laughs) No, we wouldn't do that. So just simply, Jesus is saying, take care of them, and it's stylistic variation. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, Jesus talking to Peter, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So they have breakfast. Peter gets all wet. He sees Jesus. Thank God there was a charcoal fire there to warm him up. He's fully reinstated. This is a beautiful moment. And then Jesus tells him he's going to die. Jumps right to it. By the way, you're going to die and you're going to be forced into this death. Your arms will be stretched where you don't want to go. What kind of death are we talking about here? 
probably a crucifixion. The historical record is really challenging. D.A. Carson points out that Clement of Rome in AD 96 talked about how Peter had died. And then in 212 AD, the early church father, Tertullian, he talks about how he died by crucifixion as well. Now, does he, did Tertullian have an extra source? Was he just reading this verse? We don't know for sure. But there are other accounts that says he was crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy enough to be crucified like his Lord. D.A. Carson points out that those stories are too remote and there's too much legendary material for them to be reliable. So we don't know exactly how Peter died. It seems weird that he would be crucified upside down considering that's not how crucifixion was designed to kill you. I'm sure you'd still die doing it, but... Peter probably died in Rome under Caesar Nero in the AD 60s when the persecutions were going on. Other than that, we just don't know much about his death. Now, how does Peter respond to this? You're going to die. Follow me. Peter says, yes, Lord, whatever it is you want from me. No. He turns around and sees John is probably following them on the beach, on the shore. What about this guy? (laughs) Is he going to die too? I'm filling in his words. I don't know if he said that. And then the rumor began to spread. And this is why John brings this up. The rumor spread that John was not going to die. He'd be around when Jesus showed up. But then John did die, so what would that do to the gospel? He's trying to protect the witness and the testimony of the gospel. But in a sense, what does Jesus say to Peter? Yeah, don't worry about my will for him. You follow who? Me. You cannot get into your car when you leave here and be focused and obsessed with all the drivers around you and where they're going and what they're doing. You have to keep your eyes where? On the road. If you want to drive and just stare at your window, you will eventually hit something sooner than later. What's Peter's struggle here? Probably two things that I can think of, comparison and fairness. He struggles with this. What about him? Is it really fair that I get this and maybe he doesn't? We know comparison is the thief of joy, but it's also a distractor from what's right in front of you. If you're so worried about so-and-so and how God might be working in their life, or the blessings they're getting or not getting, you're going to have a really hard time focusing on following the Lord for yourself. And I would encourage you to be very careful with the fairness question. Because if God were fair to you, where would you be right now? You would be in hell for your sins. If God were fair, we don't want to pl- I don't want to play the fair game. I'll speak for me. I want to play the grace game. I am under his grace, and whatever he decides to give me, whatever he decides to take away, it's grace. And he shepherds me, and I am good with that. And I hope that you would be good with that as well. John finishes his gospel, and here we go. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. John wrote this, not as historical fable, Not historical fiction, but historical fact. He wrote this intending to write the truth, that you would believe the truth and you would follow it with your whole heart and your whole life. He ends here though, not on himself, but on Jesus. He says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. John does speak a little hyperbole here, but the point is is that God is doing a lot more than we know in history and today. If you go back in history and you were to write down every single conversation, blessing, wisdom, and miracle Jesus did, John says there would be libraries and libraries full. We got 21 chapters from John and that took us six months to study together. Can you imagine if we had everything the Lord gave us, everything he did with all the people he healed, even in this gospel, I'm sure there was a lot more going on here. We are encouraged that God does a lot more than we know. We speak of God's goodness. It's true. And his goodness is happening in and around your life, even if you don't recognize it. We probably recognize the tip of the iceberg. You know that picture where there's an iceberg and a little bit's on top and then most of it's underwater? There's so much goodness that we don't see that's happening always and continuing in our lives by his goodness and the way he operates. 
We may not think it's goodness. We may not like it at the time, but nonetheless, it is God's goodness being displayed in our lives. In the gospel story, and even in movies, we kind of move from one action scene to the next. And we miss the minutes. We miss the hours and the contemplation in between. But in real life, there's a lot more minutes of that happening than those really high moments. We get such a picture of the disciples here. Earlier in the story, they knew it was the Lord, but they said no one dared ask him, what's happening? D.A. Carson, he points out that they know, but they're still a little bit hesitant. They're still a little bit uncertain. Why? Well, they know it's the Lord, but they're getting used to a new reality. And this is a good reminder for us as we evangelize the lost, pray for our lost loved ones, or welcome new believers into the fold. They're still getting used to a very new reality that Jesus really is alive. He really did save me, change me. What he said was really true. This is good for us even as believers for a long time to remember. Today we have been blessed to see that Jesus lives and he continues to shepherd his people there are two overall responses we can see from the text. The first one, we need to trust this testimony. John has given his life for it. And we can give our lives to follow it as well. And the second one is we want to take the same advice, the same command that Jesus gave to Peter. What does he say? You follow who? Don't you worry about the will of God for other people. You follow the Lord. You walk with him and you love him. Since John wants us to believe since John wants us to follow, part of following is first having knowledge of that and then confessing it. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you on the screen. There are five or six, I think there's six, I can't remember, things that I've pulled from the entire gospel. And we are going to go over this and confess them together out loud. This is a way for us to glorify God and to practice declaring what we believe and that out here, we'll be one step closer to declaring it out there as we go. So what I want you to do, whoever's doing the slides, count to like 10 or 15, and then go to the next slide. I want everyone just to take time and read it. Take time and read it. And then after we go through the slides, we'll go back to the first one, and we will confess these together. And I invite you to confess it if you believe it. Okay, after reading that, if you believe that, go to the first point, please. Follow along with me, and let's confess the glory of our God and Savior together. Ready, number one. Jesus, we believe you are the Word who was with God and who was God in the beginning. Number two. Jesus, we believe you became flesh and dwelt among us, revealing your glory as the one and only Son of God. Number three, Jesus, we believe you revealed the Father to us in word and deed. You turned water into wine, healed the official son, healed the lame man, fed the 5,000, walked on water, healed the blind man, and raised Lazarus from the dead. Number four, Jesus, we believe that you are the Lamb of God, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the true vine. Number five, Jesus, we believe you died a sacrificial and atoning death for our sins, rose victoriously over sin and death, and lived forever. 
Number six, Jesus, we believe you are the Christ of God, the Son of God, and trust in you for saving life. That's the gospel of John, 21 chapters in a nutshell. Have you been blessed to know the Lord in this gospel? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and let's give him thanks. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in your Son and great word indeed, water into wine. Eyes became well, legs could stand, the dead were raised. You did everything. Lord, we believe. And for those who are on the fence, give them faith. Let them confess you and let them follow up by being baptized and declaring to the world that they are with you. Lord, bless your people to live, to rest in your great truth, in your great gospel, in your great son. And it's in your name we trust, hope, and pray, Jesus Christ. Amen.